ECT treatment for depression, barbaric or life-saving? Recently, I had a patient with severe depression with suicidal thoughts. We had, we had tried all sorts of treatment, including medications and TMS, and I believe that ECT could help him. But one of his family members was against it as she had heard misinformation in the media. She would not come to the office for me to share the right information with her so her loved one doesn't have to suffer when a treatment could help him. Therefore, I decided to do this program for her and everyone like her. Have you ever been in a situation when you had to help someone choose a treatment option? It could be a friend or family member or yourself. There is so much min misinformation in the media about ECT. It scares people from getting the very treatment that can help them, either save their lives or decrease their su suffering drastically. If you would like to find facts and break the myths about ECT, you are in the right place. You would hear from experts in the field why, what, and how about ECT for depression. It can help you get the proper information to make an informed decision instead of misinformed decision about ECT, if and when needed. So stay with us today to get the right information, help someone you care about, get over the stigma, and get the ECT if it is right for them, and stop unnecessary suffering and save a life. Thank you, friends, for joining us today. I'm sure you are going to learn a lot from our guest, Dr. Joshua Bess. Hello, Dr. Bess. Good morning. Dr. Bess is highly regarded psychiatrist specializing in ECT. He has authored many papers. He has served as the president of the Washington State Psychiatric Association. If this is the first time you guys are joining us, my name is Dr. Rosina, and I have been helping people with stress, anxiety, and depression for last 20 years. As a medical doctor specializing in psychiatry, like Dr. Bess, a university professor and a best-selling author. And you are watching and listening to Happy and Healthy Mind with Dr. Rosina, where we share practical tips for your mental fitness. It is broadcasted live every Saturday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. If you're joining us during the live program, you can ask questions by putting them in the comment section. And if you are watching the recording and you would like the opportunity to join next time, you can get reminder text by texting JOYFUL to number 38470. We would be happy to send you reminders and resources link. And some of you are joining from you outside US and can't get these links. So we have recently started a Facebook group where we, can, we will share these resources too. So you can join the group Happy and Healthy Mind with Dr. Rosina. And remember to like, subscribe, and hit the bell button based on the platform you're on. So before we start asking questions to Dr. Bess, let me share this disclaimer that all this information is for educational purposes only and should not be considered treatment. Please refer to your healthcare professional for specific advice. So today we are discussing ECT for depression. Is it a barbaric treatment or a life-saving treatment? Let's find some facts and break some myths. So Dr. Bess, I have seen that people are usually not so scared of procedures for broken body, but very scared of the procedures for broken mind, especially procedures like ECT. Why is that the case? I think there are lots of reasons that people could be scared of something like ECT. A big one is how it's been portrayed in the media over the decades, a lot of people have a, a vision of ECT that is inaccurate because of movies and television shows, particularly One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest from the early 1970s. And, you know, the ECT portrayed in that movie, both the way it was done and the reason it was done, you know, wasn't even happening when the movie took place, let alone, you know, 50 years later. And there's a lack of positive, accurate portrayals, at least in the mass media. You can find them on YouTube if you look. And so that adds to the sense of you know mystery or, or fear that people might have. Uh, but also I think that it's you know something that not many people have come across. We all know someone who has had a joint replacement or who has had heart surgery. People don't often talk about their severe depression, let alone whether they've had ECT. I work with patients who 
you know, struggle whether to tell their employer or even their closest coworker what's what's happening. And so there's that lack of familiarity as well. That's so true. And I find it all the time, not just with the ECT, but a lot of treatment for mental illness, like you said, and especially the highly stigmatized treatments like ECT. So what is ECT? ECT is electroconvulsive therapy. It is a way to, in some ways, we talk about reset the brain. So ECT is a way for your brain to be activated all at once. And then the brain has a mechanism by which it stops that activation and it goes quiet. And so by using a little bit of electricity in ECT, we can get the brain to have what is in effect a seizure in the brain, not the rest of the body, that's very activated, lots of brain activity. And then the brain has a mechanism to turn it off and the most the most promising theory about how ECT works has to do with that turn off mechanism being the therapeutic part, being the part that makes the connections change and that makes the the brain health improve. So having a brain seizure seizure it kind of sounds scary. So why would we do this procedure, or in what situation would it help? It it's not something that anyone takes lightly. You know, people who practice ECT, people who get ECT and family members of those people, it's a, they understand it's a serious decision. Most of the patients that I work with or that I meet with in the office have been suffering for a very long time, years, decades, and they have tried many medications. They've done psychotherapy and, you know, they just are desperate for something to work. And ECT can work for 70 or 80 percent of even those patients. But, you know, because it's not well known, it's stigmatized. There are often people who've never heard of it, even though, you know, they've been meeting with a psychiatrist or other or other professional for a long time. There are also people who maybe haven't been sick for as long, but they have certain symptoms that are very amenable, very responsive to ECT treatment. And so, you know, we see people who maybe have been in an episode for a few months, but they have the type of depression or the type of illness for which ECT is the first line treatment. So that happens too. So what I was, you were talking about, like, you know, there are different situations where ECT is used. And so there is a question of, from the audience, does it work with dementia patients too? So that is a very good question because, you know, there's a thought that, my goodness, that someone with dementia already has problems with their brain. Why would we do something like ECT, which as I'm sure we'll talk about, uh, can cause certain types of memory loss. But in fact, you know, a person with dementia can also have severe depression or can have other illnesses that are responsive to ECT. And so as long as we have a very good idea about what we're trying to help with the ECT, we can perform ECT and people have, you know, a great response. They have improved quality of life. You know, people who have mild dementia, you know, but they're also very depressed when the depression is better you know, their, their memory and their thinking is much better. So that's great. And uh, yeah, because one of the main side effect from ECT is memory problems. So how would, how would you come around thinking, okay, this person with the memory problem can get better with something that can cause memory problem? Right, right. And one thing that we often have to keep in mind ourselves and explain to people and their families and their loved ones is, you know, depression or severe anxiety or other illnesses of the brain also really have a huge impact on your memory. And that, you know, can be fixed by something that fixes or or treats the condition. And so there are people who, if we give them a memory test before their ECT, do pretty, pretty poorly because of their depression. And after the ECT, they're back in the normal range or back where they usually would be. That's wonderful. So I have referred a lot of people for ECT when they are having suicidal thoughts. And so how does ECT help in cases with depression with suicidal thoughts? That is, I mean, that's really remarkable, actually. We see people who are, we're very worried, their families are very worried that they may attempt or complete suicide. 
and suicidal thoughts or suicidal urges is one of the things that gets better very soon, very quickly in an ECT course. And so if someone is really struggling with that, even though after two or three ECT treatments, maybe they still feel pretty depressed, they're not making a lot of improvement in their overall mood yet, the suicidal thoughts are often very much reduced or even gone. There was a large research study, multiple sites over more than a decade that looked at ECT in hundreds of patients. And they clearly documented and clearly observed that after even one or two treatments, the majority of the suicidal thoughts were were much better, if not completely gone. You know, yesterday when we were preparing, you were talking about the catatonic type of conditions. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Definitely. And this is one of my academic interests, and it's a fascinating problem that some people have where their brain or certain parts of their brain shut down or don't work at all like they're supposed to. And the classic example would be someone who, you know, is moving extremely slowly or doesn't even get out of bed at all is unable to eat or communicate. And this is a dangerous, dangerous condition. It can come along with depression or bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. It can also happen with other medical problems like a brain problem or thyroid problem. And it is extremely responsive to ECT. So if a person is in the hospital with catatonia, usually we'll try a medication that also can be helpful at even very high doses sometimes. But if that doesn't solve the problem, it's it's right to ECT. And our center has, you know, we get lots of referrals for that. And we have two or three people at any given time who are getting ECT for, for catatonia, either as part of their depression or, or something else. And the reason that it's interesting is because of the way it shows us how the brain works, because when that part of the brain doesn't work, it's quite obvious, but also because people, you know, that have such a huge response. And someone who their family was very worried about whether they were going to live even sometimes. We get to hear from people, you gave me my daughter back or you gave me my dad back. And they weren't sure if that was going to happen. And so that that's that's quite rewarding. Right. Yeah. That um, is the most satisfying part of my job when I see like you know a person really getting back to life. That's right. The life that they want to live is what yeah. I focus on. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And so in terms of, you know, having a seizure, trying to reset the brain, how did it come about? What, how did the ECT come about? The history, and there may be some legend, but the history is really observation. So before, let's say, the 1930s or 1920s, we didn't have a lot of interventions, a lot of treatments that were effective. And so psychiatrists or neurologists or other other doctors spend a lot of time observing patients in hospitals and trying to help, but they didn't have a whole lot of things in their toolbox. And so uh, these doctors in Europe observed that people who we, we, we now understand probably had catatonia, um, but they also had other conditions. If they had a seizure, if they had epilepsy as well and had a seizure, that they came out of their condition, they came out of the catatonia or the severe depression for a time. It may have been part of a day or a few days, and then they would go back. And so then the the research question was, how could we give somebody a seizure safely, reliably, you know, when we want and then have it stop? And so different things were tried. There's medication that you can inject that will give someone a seizure most of the time, though it's quite unpleasant and very, you know, very toxic. Electricity, you know, there was some fundamental understanding that the brain was electrical. And so electric electricity came up as an option. And, and a couple of researchers figured it out and they were able to help a person who was well known in the town, a person who hung out at the train station, as the story goes, who, again, probably had some form of catatonic schizophrenia. And he was the first patient, the first human subject, had a series of these treatments and was able to move back in with his family and and lead a productive life. And so, you know, it's been a matter of refining the technique over the ensuing 85 years or so, but that's how it was initially discovered. And it really did transform, you know, the field in terms of having something that was effective. 
And so over the 50, 60 years, it has been refined so much. Yeah. Um, and sometimes people are making the decision based on the depiction of 50 years back. But yes. if, we, if we look at the depiction of 50 years back, how the surgeries used to be performed, that would feel like barbaric, but they also right. save life. And, you know, people are kind of easily accept the defibrillation you know when somebody is dying we use the defibrillator and so how does the electric current of a defibrillator compare to ect yeah electricity is is complicated i always have to you know reopen my my high school physics textbook but basically what it comes down to is with defibrillation it's a lot of electricity over a very short amount of time you know you see it in the tv shows or er gray's anatomy or in the movies and people say clear and the chest jumps and there's a, a large amount of le electrical charge that's delivered immediately with ect not only is it a much lower amount the amount of electricity overall but it's over you know, six, seven or eight seconds. And so I often describe it to people as, you know, a defibrillator would be a fire hose of electricity where ECT is like a squirt gun. And mm -hmm. so it's it's just, you know, kind of goes between the two electrodes, but it's, you know, we don't, we don't clear, we don't, you know, move or people can touch the bed or adjust something on the patient's wrist or something like that. And it's not, it's not an issue. When we have trainees, when we have students or residents or people nursing students who, who have never seen an ECT procedure when they observe because they're in training or they're going to be working in the department, 100% of the time they are quite surprised at how little happens. <laughs> it's sort of anticlimactic and, mm -hmm. and so I have them observe the whole patient and observe what we're doing and you know it's very common for me to hear them say, oh is it over? Is that it? Did it happen? And that's that kind of tells you how very, you know, quiet and not, not exciting it is. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how is it given? Like, you know, just imagine there's a patient who is uh, getting ready or considering the treatment, what you tell them, what is going to happen in the, uh, the procedure? Yeah, you know, it, it's unique in that it's a procedure, sure. People have procedures like colonoscopies or surgery, but it's a series of procedures. And so, you know, there, there aren't a lot of analogies or a lot of common things in medicine that are like that. But let's just take one example. So one procedure and you, you're a patient, you get up and you have an appointment time you make sure that you haven't eaten for a number of hours and you go to the hospital or the treatment center, check in, say hello to the nurse and you go to a, a prep area and someone puts an, uh, an IV, you know, one of those intravenous catheters in your arm or your wrist and you wait in that area. And when it's your turn, depending on the center, most of the time you go to the room, the treatment room. And you know the team is there, the, the psychiatrist, the anesthesiologist, a nurse, staff member, they check in. This is your first treatment. They give you a lot more education. They kind of tell you what to expect. Maybe it's your 10th treatment and they, you know, you know the routine. They can check in to make sure that you're doing okay as far as side effects, how the, how the procedure is going. And then when you're ready, the anesthesiologist gives medication in the IV to put you to sleep. And then you get medication in the IV to in effect, paralyze your muscles, we, you know, relax your muscles is a nicer way to say it. And then the psychiatrist, once all that is done and we make sure that you're asleep and that your muscles aren't, aren't moving, and the psychiatrist delivers the electricity, that's six to eight seconds, and then your brain has a seizure. And we're monitoring the seizure on a, a pretty basic EEG, that's the machine that measures brain waves. We can see that your brain is having that activity Usually your body is perfectly still. Sometimes your foot might be twitching, but you know, you're lying there and your brain has a seizure. It stops itself within a minute or so. And effectively that's the end of the procedure as far as the ECT itself is concerned. The anesthesiologist monitors your oxygen levels and your, your heart rate and things like that. And as you start to breathe again on your own, because before that they were helping you, the procedure is over with and you go to the recovery area and stay there for 15 or 20 minutes um, until you're ready to go home. And so it's remarkable if you think about all the things that are happening that you know, you're at the hospital for less than two hours, usually an hour or so, you, you get general anesthesia, you go to sleep, you have a brain seizure, it stops, you wake up from the general anesthesia, 
10 or 15 minutes later, you're having some juice and crackers and then you're ready to go home. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a pretty straightforward procedure. <laughs> Although, you know, it totally makes sense that people would be nervous about it. It is a medical procedure. There are things that, you know, sometimes happen that are unexpected, but then you do that two or three times a week and eventually start feeling better. Yeah. So like 10 to 12 times, what's the general number of procedures people need? The, the average number, it, we, we talk about 12 treatments mm -hmm. and that's just because it's a nice round number in terms of three times a week for four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so for a month, there are people who get better quicker than that. And there are people who need more than 12 before they're you know, much better or in remission. And that's for the acute, you know, for the short term ECT course, you know, there's a, more to talk about, you know, down the road as far as do you do some sort of maintenance ECT or how do we decide when to stop? But generally it's a, it's four weeks or so of three times a week treatment. And we can have a very good idea by then whether the person's going to respond or not. So big, big problem that people are scared of and many people do go through is the memory problem with ECT. So how, what percent of the people develop memory problems? So we talk about three types of thinking or memory problems with ECT. And the first is the immediate after period. So 10 or 15 minutes after the treatment, people are confused. That's going to happen no matter what. You know, your brain has a seizure, then it stops the seizure and, and basically resets itself until you're awake again and oriented, you know, someone is there to reassure you that things are okay. So that's almost everybody. The second part is the short-term memory loss. And what happens there is when you're having a seizure like that two or three times a week, your brain doesn't make good memories. It's, it's hard for the system that, you know, writes down your memories to work effectively. And so what I tell people is, the example I give is a patient, a young lady I treated, several years ago who had ECT over the winter holidays. And for that year, I saw her for several years afterward. For that year, she didn't really remember the winter holidays. She remembered previous years. She remembered subsequent years. It was a big deal for her family. They usually took a trip and things like that. And so, you know, the time around the ECT, she just didn't really remember. So that's pretty common. It's not everybody, um, but I would say that that's 50% or 40% of people will have pretty significant memory hole around the time of the ECT. But she, you know, that, that particular patient went on to college. She's now working full time. She remembered things from before that, you know, it's just around that time of treatment. What people really worry about is the least common, which is losing, the fancy word for it is losing retrograde memory or retrograde amnesia from before. And those are the things that get highlighted in some of the anti-psychiatry or anti-ECT things that are posted online that, you know, someone who's had a course of ECT has problems remembering a lot of things from the past. And it happens. You know, anyone who tells you that never happens is not telling you the truth. It's exceedingly rare. It's hard to study, but estimates are in the one to two, you know, one out of every 200 patients sort of range. So, you know, one half percent. I've had maybe two or three situations in my whole career where I saw someone who, you know, had a course of ECT and then, you know, did not have memory for a lot of things from the past. So it's something that you should always talk about with, with everyone, but, you know, yeah. with the doctor who's maybe recommending ECT, with your other providers, with your family, you know, we don't understand a lot about why that happens in some cases, but not others. There are some theories about that, but you should really, you know, know what you're getting into, but also know that 199 times out of 200, that's not going to happen. And, you know, the vast majority of those people respond very well. Yeah. We always take the risk, even when you have a dental procedure, that is a risk. That's and right. so you have to take the risk. But, you know, ECT has been there for like, you know, 50, 60 years in practice. And it has been kind of the go to treatment for many of these conditions that we did not have treatment. And some of the newer advanced treatments are coming now that are really exciting. So when TMS came out, you know, it was very exciting. So I started doing TMS for my patients. So how do you and we did another program on TMS that I can share the link with people. So here I want to ask, like, you know, how do you compare TMS with ECT and in which situations you choose one or the other? 
So there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, you know, people who have had experience with TMS or ECT or anything else know that there's pros and cons. Our, our office actually, you know, we work with an entire chart of pros and cons, logistics and side effects and efficacy, cost, things that you've tried before. There may be a reason why you can't do TMS, you might have metal in your in your head or in your face, or a reason that you can't do ECT for that matter. So when we're sitting down with someone, I had a consultation earlier this week with someone who had tried several medications, had never had any of the other treatments like TMS or ECT. And so I did go through each and every step of that discussion. In general, you know, there is a rule or a rule of thumb that people who can try TMS first aren't as severe. Um, so that's a general rule. Um, some of those things that I talked about as far as being kind of a, not an automatic, but a first line ECT condition like catatonia, depression where the person else also has psychosis. Psychosis meaning that they hear voices or that they have paranoid beliefs or something like that. Those aren't good TMS patients. They should get ECT. But someone who isn't that severe or can try, has time to try, a less invasive option, TMS is a very good idea to try first. And so I sometimes see it as a, you know, there's the local train or bus and there's the express bus. And so, you know, if you're on the local, you might be able to try TMS, you might be able to try maybe a fancy new medication combination or Spravato, which I know you also offer and we can talk about before you get to ECT, if you even have to go that far. But there are some people who are on the express bus who get on the bus and ECT is the only stop. Um, you know, for them, because that's the appropriate treatment. Yeah. So yeah, let's kind of share a little bit about Stravado because I'm really excited that it got indication for acute suicidal thoughts, and depression, but it is yeah. only for depression with acute suicidal thoughts or severe depression that has not right. responded to medication. So how do you decide between two? And tell us a little bit about Stravado too, what it is. Yeah, so Spravato is the pharmaceutical manufacturer took ketamine, which has been in the news a lot over the past five years or so as far as being a depression treatment off-label. You have to give that disclaimer for sure. And so a pharmaceutical company was able to refine the ketamine to be just part of the compound. And this has happened before with other antidepressants. And so refining it just as part of this compound, and they formulated it into a nasal spray. And so a patient comes to the office twice a week for the first several weeks and does the nasal spray in the office. We're observing them for two hours, making sure that they don't have severe side effects or elevated blood pressure or something like that. And it's a great option. It's again, one of those that's on the local bus instead of the express because it's less invasive. It's often more available because it can be at your local psychiatrist office. And so, the ketamine was noted to be effective for suicidal thinking. And it was very exciting when Spravato showed that, that same effect. And my understanding is that there have been studies and people are actually trying to have it avail available in some emergency rooms as well, given that it can have such a short-term positive benefit for someone who's in, in a major crisis. Yeah. I'm really excited to use this um, uh, treatment. It's kind of a procedure because the patient has to come to the office, but they usually are like, you know, resting after taking this nasal inhaler. We are right. not giving any IV and we are observing them. And then um, when they're fine, they go home. And I have seen benefit in people who have failed medication failed TMS, and then started responding to Stravato. And yes, like you said, in certain situations where it is not appropriate, either like, you know, because of the psychosis or because of the metal or because of some other past history, it's not appropriate. And in those situations, I send patients to you for ECT. Right. And so I am, I'm really excited to get this information out to people. And so, and let me ask Dr. Bess at this time, are there resources that you could share with their audience? Yeah, there's a, so there's a lot of inaccurate information available online, especially if you just Google ECT or electro, electroconvulsive therapy. Our office has a handout that we give people who are interested. Um, it's quite extensive, so I don't mean to overwhelm people, but it lists, you know, eight to 10 
videos that are available on YouTube that really are accurate portrayals. Some of them are from a patient perspective. They talk about their experience and what it was like to go through the treatment. And then some of them are more of the, you know, the doctor talking about how it's done and why it's done and things like that. And so they're sort of in order of when I recommend them to people on that on that sheet. So the first couple, the first two or three are quite good and, and cover a lot of ground. There are books out there, you know, they're a, a little bit dated now, but you know, Kitty Dukakis wrote a famous book and she's a great advocate for making ECT available. There are other books from patient perspectives. So one of the authors of one of those books I heard speak at a conference and she's a very good advocate for you know having access to ECT. It saved her life. There are some famous people who have had ECT. Carrie Fisher had a book, um, a quite funny book called Shockaholic that, you know, tongue in cheek has some humor in it, um, but also does talk about how, you know, her family or other people were worried about her um, getting this treatment, but it was, it was really, really helpful for her. Wonderful. Um, so it seems like there's a lot of resources that you have collected. And so let me share with the audience if they want to get this resource, our usual number, 38470. You can text word joyful and we will send you the link for this resource. And if you want to connect with Dr. Best, this is his website, seattlentc.com. And so before we go into special of the day, do you... And, and I have a special that would help people make the decision, hard decisions uh, like this. So stay tuned for that. But let me ask Dr. Best, do you have any, do you have any message for our audience? I mean, the message I always try to give anybody is, is hope. These are people who have been struggling for a very long time or, you know, with a very severe illness and they're not sure if, it, if things are ever going to be okay again. Family members are are worried or, and taxed and exhausted, but there is hope. I mean, even in situations where someone has been ill for decades, it can help. And so I always wanna explain to people that this isn't the last resort. And, you know, maybe for a different episode, but ECT is not the last resort. I mean, there's always new research and new, new interventions that are being worked on that can help people as we understand more and more about the brain. That's wonderful. So now is the time for special. So today's special is for people to to who have hard time making decisions. Actually, most of the people have some difficulty making decisions, especially when it comes to making hard choices. So I, I learned a technique when I was growing up and it really helped me through my life. And so I wanted to share that with you. Would you like to learn? All right, so I call it plus minus neutral technique. And what it means is that if you have two choices, and let me just use the example that after I had a car accident, I uh, broke my hand and so I had to go for the surgery. There was no time to even make the decision if I should go for the surgery or not because my hand was like, you know, really uh, crooked at that time. But what happened was after the surgery over the next uh, six months, I had extreme pain because they had put a blade over here, uh, blade and screws. So every time my hand was moving, there was a tendon that was passing over that blade. And so it was causing me a lot of pain. And so all the physical therapy that was not helping. And so when I was talking to my surgeon, he said, well, the, uh, the option is to go do the surgery again and take out that plate. And so it was only six months. So there's chances that the bones may not have healed and you may get more complicated. The pain may become chronic. And of course, you, will, you may develop uh, some scar tissue. And so here I had to make a very hard decision. Like many times people had to make the decision if they should go for ECT or not go for ECT. Uh, so life presents situation where you have to make a difficult decision. And so I had to go through this exercise myself. And so I said, okay, I have a choice to go for the surgery or not go for the surgery, right? So if I go for the surgery, what are the benefits? Well, there's 50% chance that I, my pain may get better and 50% chance that it may not get better. What are the negatives? Well, I could have all these complications that doctor is talking about and I would have pain as well as the complications. 
And what is the neutral? Neutral was like, you know, I may be able to function better or not. So it's kind of in between. And so I had to do the same thing. Okay, if I don't go for the procedure, what would happen? I was 100% chance that I was going to continue to have that pain or at least 90% chance. And I may not have the complications, but my life would be affected. So by putting this in perspective, I said, okay, if I take the step, there's 50% chance of improvement and there's risk. And if I don't take the, make the decision or of going for the surgery, there's 100% chance that my pain would continue. And I went for the for the procedure. And I'm really grateful that I did not develop too many complications. There's some complications. I still have the scar and stuff and there's some movement restricted but to most degree my pain was relieved so i i was very grateful for making the decision and so i would say to the audience like when you are uh, in a situation where you have to make some difficult decision think about what would be the positive plus of this decision a negative of this decision what would be the neutral result and then compare it with the pros and cons of the other alternative and sometimes it would be the alternative of not making the decision but then you are choosing to stay in that situation so what do you think about that uh, technique dr best i mean I, that's basically a different way of saying you know what we really tell people every day <laughs> that's right. i think sometimes we all have difficulty assessing risk and figuring out how it's going to have an impact on our life so that's a really really great way to look at it Wonderful. So let me leave the audience with a question. If, if you guys can put in the comment, by listening to all this information, do you think you are more likely to suggest this procedure to somebody who can benefit from this procedure? Or are you still so scared that you would never go for a procedure like this. And on that note, just remember what comes to you is not in your control, but what you do or how you respond to it is in your control. Make an intentional choice. You can do it. Till next time, Dr. Rosina.